to another episode of Tell Your Story. I'm your host, Todd Nesloni, the Director of Culture and Strategic Leadership with TEPSA. And each episode, I look to bring you somebody who has encouraged, inspired, or challenged me in one way or another and bring them on to share some of their story in hopes that it inspires you to tell some of yours. I am so thrilled today to have my friend, Corey Markison, on with me today. Corey, tell everybody a little bit about who you are. Hi. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I am a well, currently a third grade math teacher out of Dallas, Texas. Um, I have taught first, second, and third grade now. Um, I have a degree in special education and a master's in special education and behavior analysis. So I have a little bit of everything. But yeah, I'm so happy to be here. I didn't even know that last part. Oh, that that is me. Yeah. I have even more questions to ask. So first yeah. thing I want to say, of course, is did you always want to be a teacher growing up, or was it something that you kind of just fell into? No, I always want to do this. I'm very much okay. So I recently got into like Enneagram types. Are you familiar? Uh -huh. Yes. I'm, I'm a strong type eight. Like that's like the leader wants to take control, wants to do it all. And I'm sure after working with you, some, I'm sure you can see that now. But I have, I mean, since I was like five, I wanted to control my family and my friends and my stuff. <laughs> and I was doing school for as long as I can remember. And I remember when I was little, I used to like be the person, can I not go to recess and come inside and help you or go help another? that was 100% me. So this has always been what I wanted to do. And my parents are very much like, are you sure you don't want to be a lawyer? Like you're really good at arguing. <laughs> and I'm like, nope, this is what I want to do. And then I'm also, if you tell me it's what I shouldn't do, then I'm like, no, it's what I'm going to do. Uh -huh. I try to no. say, go be a lawyer or do this or do that. I'm like, just because of that, I'm going to prove you wrong and I'm going to go be a teacher. <laughs> yeah. I can totally relate to that. But did you always, were you always drawn, drawn to the younger grade levels? Yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, I like, went into it dead set on being a kindergarten teacher. And now I'm like, I can't imagine going back or doing, you know, younger grades. But yeah, I've always wanted to be, you know, kindergarten, probably third grade was the highest. I'd always love special education. So yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask, where did the interest in special education come from? So actually when I was in like elementary school and growing up, I used to spend every recess going and helping other teachers and I would go help out. And I was always like the buddy person and I loved it. And so then in high school, I did an internship and we went every day for like two hours into a classroom and helped out. Um, but it was when I was in that internship, I kind of realized like you have kids of every level in your classroom. And even our kids who are special needs and have those services, they don't get the services 24 seven all day long. Like the teachers truly do need to be experts in how to teach to every child. And so then when I went to college, um, I went to Texas Tech University and they make you pick a specialization and that was one of the options. And I was like, you know, that's the best thing. I never intended on being a special ed teacher and doing like a self-contained class, but I always wanted to know in my general ed class that I could confidently meet the needs of everyone in there. So that's how I went down that road and I've loved it. I mean, I've never, again, I've never been a special ed teacher, but I have used that bit of my degree every single day. So, you know, and when I talk to people who are becoming educators, they always say like, you know, should I get the special ed certification? Should I get the ESL? And I'm like, yes, because I don't care what kind of kids you are teaching. You yeah. are going to have English language learners in there oh, yeah. and you're going to have kids that struggle with learning. And so the more you can put into your arsenal, the better of a teacher you're going to be. Oh, for sure. And so that's when I actually went to grad school. And when I went at first, I was like, I'll just do like educational leadership. But, you know, my, my mom did say, if you ever decide you don't want to be a teacher, pick something that you could like use somewhere. I was like, OK, fine. So that's when I went special ed and um, applied behavior analysis. Like, well, I could work in a clinic if I ever wanted to, which <laughs> I will never want to. But I could. But well, even in doing that, I'm like, I, I have never technically used that degree, but I've used it every single day. Like just yeah. the more you know, you'll be able to help more kids and you don't even realize it just becomes natural. Yeah. Well, and you know, I've been following you for a while on Instagram and I have always just been blown away with your creativity and, and the kind of things you come up with. When did that become, I guess, maybe, uh, maybe passion's not the right word, but when did that become a passion of yours that you really wanted to add that extra element into your classroom? Um, I would say, I think it was my second or third year of teaching it, it like light bulb moment. Of course it was actually from following Hope King. You know, I, I heard some things she did, but I remember it was in my second or third year and everyone's like, Oh, the first year is so hard. And you think, okay, so the second year it gets easier. And I think in that second or third year, I was like, this isn't actually getting any easier. It's getting harder. And like, am I doing this wrong? Yep. I was, and it was kind of hitting that wall of like, it was getting hard and I wasn't seeing the light in the tunnel. I'm like, am I enjoying this every day? 
And so trying to figure out how can I enjoy it more and make it more fun for them while I'm doing all this really hard work. If I'm going to do it, I need to have fun with it. And um, after following Hope King, I kind of saw something she did and it was just like, oh my gosh, duh. Like that so is my personality. I've been doing like artsy, crafty things my whole life and finding little things. And I was like, why have I not already tried to merge these two things that I love into one? And so then when I started doing that, I mean, it just makes teaching so much more fun. Well, I know that you love teaching and you can tell that you love doing the transformations and things like that. And, you know, if anybody is following you on Instagram, they're also going to know that you kind of love The Bachelor. <laughs> and so when did that become such a such a passion of yours to do? Actually, and it hasn't even been. My friends have made me watch it every season and they're like, come on, we're watching. I'm like, I'm not watching the next season. I'm not watching it. And then I go watch and I'm like, it's just like such good content. I'm like, it's so good. And then of course they never pick who I want them to pick. So it's fine. I'm like, they just leave them on the side, you know? Well, I don't even watch The Bachelor, but when you do Insta stories over The Bachelor, I will watch every single one of them because you are just so hilarious and you watch with your friends and they get so into it too. Yeah. So I love that it's another thing that y'all can bond over. Oh yeah. Like, I mean, I will say that is probably my, the best thing in my teaching career is who I work with. Like I work with all my best friends. And so we go to work all day we do the really hard stuff. And then we're like, let's go hang out and have fun together. And so it's silly stuff like watching the bachelor. And really, I only went over there because they were like, we're going to have a, a cheese board and pizza. And I'm like, okay, I'll go. <laughs> so that's how I get sucked into it. But you watch the first episode. I'm like, okay, we need like a bracket now. I need to make my choices. I need to have opinions on everybody. But we have, I get yelled at a lot because our episodes end up lasting like four hours long because we have to pause and rewind so many times. <laughs> Well, and I think what, what what I love watching about that, what it shows me and reminds me is how important it is to not get so consumed with the education side of things that you yeah. forget to have fun outside of school and to get to know the people you work with and form those kind of relationships where you guys can go and laugh about The Bachelor and not talk about your classroom at all and just be real people with each other too. Have you found that really helping keep your flame lit? Oh my gosh, yes. Like I... I, I don't know, I, you know, I, and I think through social media, I've realized how lucky I am in that and that I work with my best friends because all people might be like, oh my gosh, my team and I don't get along. And I'm like, how do you do this job? Like, it is such a hard job and it takes so much out of you. I don't, I can't comprehend going every day and not loving who I work with. So I've been so blessed in that aspect, but I mean, it just... I learn from all my friends. They all have such different strengths. We're all so very different. So getting to see that and kind of learn from each other, but then also just genuinely appreciating them as a person and getting to hang out. Like I, again, it's too hard of a job. And I've said so many times, I feel like honestly, any teacher could teach any grade level or any content, as long as you have a good team. You know, I, I could go to sixth grade. I'm not sure I'd love it. I could teach kindergarten. I'm not sure it's where I'm meant to be, but if I had a team that was strong and I love being with, I, I think we could all do it, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, I think you're exactly right because when you have those people around you, it makes coming to school. I mean, I, I loved my kids 100%, but there were still some days where it was hard coming in because of some of the people that you have to work with or things like that. So I think you just hit the nail on the head that when you work around people who just lift you up and, mm -hmm. and, and, and help you along the way, it's like, I could teach any grade level. It may not be the one I want, but I could still do it and do it well. Yeah. And you know, you, you, you and I got to know each other through a conference called Get Your Teach On. And, and I know that you probably get asked this all the time um, because I've seen several stories where you're like, okay, people are asking again, but, but I'm going to ask you on here again. But, you know, how did you not only, I mean, everybody, we, we find out about Get Your Teach On, people that we are following and things like that. But how did you get to like you pretty much run so much of that behind the scenes stuff because let me tell you I can tell you right now for anybody listening Adam DeVico and I thank god we have Corey because she's like hey, I need this hey where's your guys stuff for this hey you need to put this stuff in there and I'm like I'm so glad you are type a and that is you but how did you get to that point where you were all involved with get your teach on I mean, people ask all the time and I honestly, my, like my answer is it was a God thing. Like it, there, there's no secret like trick or pathway or how it happened. Uh, it was God. I mean, we went, um, my friends, Megan and Chelsea and I all went to get your teach on. I think it was the second ever get your teach on and we loved it. We had a blast, but I mean, we didn't really reach out or talk to the people while we were there. It was kind of, we stayed in our own little bubble. Um, 
And while I was there, I was drawing and doodling because I'm always having to do things with my hands. So I was drawing little doodles of like Hope and Wade and everybody. And I posted it and they liked it. And so then we kind of, I guess, connected through social media. And through that, had just messaged back and forth a couple of times. Megan and I dressed up as Hope and Amy for Red Ribbon Week. It was like, what you want to be when you grow up? And we're both laying in bed at 10 p.m. Like, what do we want to be? We're like, well, we want to be like a teacher. So let's just dress up as them. So that's what we did. And um, from there, they came to our school and surprised us just to say hi one time when Hope and Wade were in Dallas. And um, this was right around the time the Dallas conference they're about to have, or the Texas tour. They're having three three conferences in Texas was happening. So they were at our school and we just kind of threw it out there like, hey, do y'all need help? And at that point, there was no magic squad. There was no behind the scenes. It was the presenter setting it up. And they kind of awkwardly like, well, I mean, if you want to come, we're having in Forney, that's fine. And so we went and we're like, we don't really know what we're doing. We don't know if we're really supposed to be here. We just kind of jumped in and started selling t-shirts and setting up tables. And then um, it was summer. And so they were going to Houston and San Antonio. And we just kind of said, hey, we have nothing to do. Do you want us to go? And they're like, Sure. So we were kind of like awkwardly tagged on and invited ourselves. And then once that happened, we just said, hey, we can go to Chicago. So I think that's kind of us not being afraid to put ourselves out there and say, this is something we really enjoy. And if you, um, and then from there, it just kind of snowballed every conference a little bit more. And, and again, I'm very much the kind of person, like, if I see something I want, I'm like, let's make it happen. Like, I want to do it. I'm going to put myself out there. I don't, I, I rip the bandaid off. I want to do this. And so that was kind of what get your teach on. I'm like, Hey, and there was one that was like, Hey, we need, we need more people. Do you want me to like set up a schedule? And they're like, sure. <laughs> so I think it was seeing the need or seeing something and not being afraid to say what you feel and what you want. That's kind of, I mean, how it snowballed into what it is. And I'm so, so thankful because I've met so many amazing people and it's, it's just been the best. And what I, what I think people don't realize is how much work goes on behind the scenes, you know, and, and even people that have been on the magic squad have seen pieces of it, but there are so many cogs in the wheel to keep yeah. this thing running that until you like have your hands in so much stuff like you do, you don't even realize like, God, people don't know that this goes into play and this goes into play. And if this doesn't work, these other dominoes don't fall. So somebody has to run in and fix it real quick. And so what's been the biggest thing that you've learned throughout all of this? Um, kind of in leading, like, I think, you know, like I said, my type eightness, eightness, I've always wanted to be the leader, the one in charge. Like, I want to have my hands in control of all of this. And I think with Get Your Teach, and I realized more and more, me being a better leader is stepping out a little bit and putting people in the right spots. Um, because I think when I tried to make sure I was doing it all, it like crashes and burns. And so kind of seeing it, seeing something and saying, you know, this person's really good at that, but also like going and asking their opinion. Because I mean, Get Your Teach On's gotten so big now, like I'm not getting to be at every session, see everything. And so reaching out to those people and saying, hey, what didn't work? What worked? How can I make this better for you? And asking their opinions. I feel like those are some of the things that I've learned the most through all of this and getting it to work well is trying to take some of that. It's not, you know, all, me leading it. How can I use these people best? Well, and I think that's really powerful that you've already learned that because I know my first year as a principal, that was a lesson I learned the hard way because, you know, as a teacher, when you're in your own classroom, it's like, I know that I have a vision and I can do that vision the best. So I'm just going to get it done because nobody else can do it as quickly or the way I want it done. And when yeah. you get in a leadership role, you always start with that mindset of, well, I'll just do all of this because I know what I'm trying to say. And it's easier than trying to explain it. And then you're like, okay, I can't do all of this. Like I'm falling, all this stuff is falling apart. And you're like, God, now I got to start trusting people and hoping. And then you start passing things out, people to do to help out. And you're like, Wow, they did it way better than I even yeah. had imagined. And so, you know, thinking about all this leadership stuff that you're learning, do you ever see that down your path of being a school leader one day or anything? I don't know. I don't. People say that all the time, and I, you know, I never want to say like never. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, I'm I truly am loving working with the kids, and mm -hmm. you know, I think sometimes we get too set on like what's my next move, right. and I'm like our career is a long, I've got a long time. So I'm like, you know, I want to stay in what I'm enjoying and happy and for as long as I can. It's, I, I could see it fitting in parts of my personality, but I also want to make sure I still have like the joy and the love of it. And oh, what y'all do as principal is just like that overwhelms me and stresses me out. I'm like, oh, I don't know. So we'll see. And, you know, come back to me in 10 years and maybe I'll say something different. But right now I'm just loving the classroom. And, and I think having to get your teach on side of it, I can get some of that out of my system. 
yeah. and then go back and just really enjoy my kids. I think that's great. Well, you know, one thing that I always, that I've talked about in so many episodes is the idea of doubt and comparison. And I know, you know, you are active on social media and not only are you active, but I know you're interacting with tons of people who are doing also incredible work. And so what do you do when those doubts start to creep in? Like, well, I'm, I'm not as good of a teacher as them, or I can't be sharing this because it's just, it's not as good as somebody else. Like, how do you keep that at bay? I think trying to like focus on what your strengths are. Like we all have very different strengths that I would say like, you know, we were talking about teammates earlier and how teams work together. And again, my team, the past couple years, my second grade team, they're all my very best friends and we all could not be more different. And we had to have some very honest conversations about like accepting those differences and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And one thing was like, you know, room transformations. I love to go all out. And so then we kind of had that struggle of, well, does that mean we all need to do this? Like, like <laughs> to be a good teacher, do I have to do what Corey does? And I was like, by no means, please don't. Like, if you're not gonna enjoy it, it's not going to have the same out, you know, effect. And there are different things in my classroom. Like I go in Chelsea's room and I'm like, Oh, she's so good at that. You know, like that's amazing. And I want to go try to do it. And I'm like, if it's not feeling comfortable and natural for me, mm -hmm. then the kids still aren't getting that same effect from it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like it, it has to be your personality. And I think kind of having some of those conversations and realizing where our lanes are and where our, our strengths are when playing off those and then trying to find like one thing that, you know, I could really improve here and build on it. But I think focusing on your strength and not trying to compare yourself overly to I want to be that or, you know, trying to change your personality to mold into somebody else's. No, like, I on social media, a lot of have to because I know I, you know, room transformations are big and flashy. And, and I feel like I'm constantly having to tell people if this isn't right for you, please don't do it. Like, this is not me saying this is the right way to teach. This is me saying this is what brings me joy. And I think trying to find what brings you joy would be the biggest thing. Well, and I think you hit the nail on the head there. If you are not having fun, it's not for you. Mm -hmm. And I think in the in the end, that's what we want as educators. We want to have fun with our kids because if we're all enjoying it, they're going to learn more. And yeah. so if you're miserable trying to be what you think is the perfect teacher because of what you see online, you're always going to be miserable because it's not something you enjoy. So I think that was great advice. Well, and I think there's, Right now, you can find research-based strategies that promote every which yes. way. Like, there's research for this, and there's research for that. And it's like, I know my personality. I'm like, I like a loud classroom, moving classroom. You know, and some people love the really quiet, flexible seating and, you know, silent small groups where everyone has all their different stations. And, and I can try that, and it stresses me out. And yes. I know I am not a comfortable teacher in that atmosphere. And then I know that pushes off into my kids. So it's kind of like, yes, finding that research-based strategy, but also the one that fits you best because that'll be your classroom best. And I think, too, if we try to all become a mold of each other, kids' learning experiences, they don't need the same teacher from kindergarten to 12th grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like, if everyone focuses on what their strength is, every year they could get a phenomenal teacher and they see a different aspect for a year and they see these things. And the next year it's technology and they see this way. Everyone just kind of, like, focus on what is your your lane. <laughs> Yep. I think that that's, that's exactly right. Well, you know, Corey, this is a big question. So I know you're probably going to have multiple answers. So just pick one. But when you look at your life and all the things you've been through, all the positives, the negatives, the hard, the great, the celebratory, all of that and in between, what would you say is one of the really monumental moments that played into um, you becoming the woman you are today? Um. Oh, well really like life-wise, it was my dad. I mean, my dad from when I was little, he used to always just say, and I have it on my classroom wall, it says be significant. And that was his phrase and everything. And it's like my motto of life is just be significant. Because I remember when I was younger and it was little stuff like trying out for a volleyball team and I didn't make the team I wanted. And he said, you know, well, that's done. You didn't make that team. You made this team, but you need to go out every single day and be significant on that team. He's like, in whatever role you're in, be the best, stand out. You know, and if you being significant is pushing yourself in this way, no matter where you are in life and whatever role you have, you can have a significant impact in that place. And he kind of said, just make sure whatever you're doing, if you left, there would be a hole. Right. And I think that's played a lot. I mean, you know, as in college and other things that don't go your way, it's kind of like, okay, well, here's, here's where I'm at and how mm -hmm. can I play a significant role there? And so that's kind of how I think about teaching um, with kids. You know, it's like, I want to be the teacher that I needed when I was a kid. Well, that's not what every kid needs. 
And so I've just said, I want to be a significant teacher to each child. And what that's going to look like for each child is going to be very different. You know, someone may, for me to be significant to them, it's to push them academically and not let them be lazy. <laughs> if another one it just needs them to love, you know, they need me to love on them. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what that means for them to be that significant person in their life where they look back and they say, you know what, that she made an impact. I love that. That's beautiful. I've never heard that be significant, but it yeah. makes total sense, especially when you talk about, you know, even in the moments where you're not happy with where you are, just be significant in there. And that's, I love that. Well, Corey, one of the questions I always love to end all of these conversations on is, you know, we have a lot of, I have a lot of people who are, some are educators, some are not who listen to this, but you know, when you're thinking about if anybody out there, if there was one thing that you wish more people knew or understood, what would your one thing be? My one thing would just be like, do what brings you joy and mm -hmm. don't try to do someone else's, you know, be someone else's joy. Like what brings me joy may not bring you joy. What works for me may not work for you. But I think everyone is just out here trying to figure out how to navigate through life. And no two people are ever going to look the same. And I think that comparison is the thief of joy is a big thing. And I think that's hard on social media. And so I feel like it puts a lot of people on both sides of social media kind of in a, do I share this? Am I comparing myself to that person? You know, everyone out there has that. Um, so I think just if everyone just focuses on what brings them joy and, you know, what their road is, kind of focusing on do what's right for you. I love that. Well, Corey, I have been a fan of yours for so long. And when you agreed to come on, I was like, yes, I'm so excited to get to talk to her. So thank you so much for being a guest today, Corey. This was so fun. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you everybody for listening or watching another episode of Tell Your Story. Remember, you can check out past episodes on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts, it's there. I hope today's conversation with Corey has inspired you to get out there and tell your story because every story matters.